All right, so we're here today for um, integrating alignment. It's not as hard as you think, and I think it's um, a really great topic for us. And I'm just going to start a little timer for myself here so I don't talk too long, and then we'll get going. Oh, but I'm typing on the wrong keyboard because I have two computers set up. So it would help if I used the one on my laptop, huh? All right, there we go. Okay, so um, we're going to be joined today by Brenda Boyd, Christy Spinney, and Judy Penn. I will introduce them here in just a minute. I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth webinar of the 2015 IGNIS series. And as you know, we started this series last year, and Jen and I are having a lot of fun with this. So we're really thrilled to have you all join us today. And as a reminder for those of you who may not have tuned in before, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite. And that's what we hope to do with these webinars is to ignite your curiosity and to expose you to opportunities for um, new understanding and to share our collective wisdom throughout the system. This series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and our teaching, our assessment teaching and learning offices. And normally you'd have two hosts today, but Jennifer Wetham, my counterpart, is not able to join us this afternoon. She's facilitating at another function. Um, she is an SBCTC program administrator for faculty development. And um, I will be hosting you today. So this is Alyssa Sells, for those of you that don't know me. And I'm um, a program administrator in the e-learning office at SBCTC. So um, Jennifer and I, our paths cross quite frequently, um, kind of two sides of the same coin. So um, we both deal with faculty professional development. All right, so moving on, we're um, really excited to offer this webinar to you because um, we are just so enthusiastic about the presenters that we bring in. And we are joined today by um, a lovely group of ladies. And um, before we start, we start, I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for sharing their collective knowledge with us and joining us today. Um, so uh, today we're going to get started by running through just a few of our Collaborate tools and doing a few quick group activities. And then I'll get to introducing our presenters. So for those of you that have, um, oh, the, the fantastic duo, yes, the dynamic duo, the, um, the wonder twins, yes, we've, we've got quite a reputation. Judy, I see your little note in the chat there. All right, so um, for those of you that may have logged in a minute late, or are just barely joining us, um, go ahead and test your audio. You'll find that in the Tools menu at the top left of your screen. And um, just go ahead and click on Tools and then run the Audio Setup Wizard. It just takes a minute or so, and that'll make sure that your mic and speakers are ready for participation in our webinar today. All right, let's see. Next slide. Um, just real quick about our meeting interface. These are the different parts. There's the audio video panel where you see my picture right now. Uh, there's the participants area where you can see, you can scroll up and down and see everyone who's logged in to join us today. There's a chat at the bottom. Most of you have already found that. Uh, we will be using that um, during, during the webinar. Uh, there's a toolbar. It's a skinny little thing right in the very middle between the whiteboard and the participant panel. And then you have the whiteboard space now where you're seeing these slides. OK, so for participant tools, you can show us some um, emoticons. And I'll go ahead and give you one right now so that you can um, see what that looks like. You should see um, a smiley face right under my name. You can also step away and let us know that you needed to step away for a second. Uh, you can raise your hand if you'd like to be called on to speak. There's a polling function that we're going to use in a minute. Um, right now it's showing a check mark. I am going to actually change that to ABC. So in just a second, that's going to change to an A. Uh, there's some permissions there to let you know which tools you have access to. And then um, you can tell that your talk button is on. And I'll show you that talk button in just a second. Um, that talk button is on when you see the blue microphone next to your name. And we do ask that when you're not speaking that you have your talk button turned off because we do you all hear background noise. All right. Uh, so this is the chat window during the webinar. Please type questions and comments here. There are also emoticons that you can put into the chat as well. And I'll do one of those for you now just so you can see. OK, so I gave you guys a smiley with some sunglasses. So those are kind of fun. Um, you're in the main chat right now, and then there's a separate private chat for moderators. You also can send, um, there's um, a way to send private chats to each other as well. I don't use that feature very often, but it is in here. 
Okay, our whiteboard tools. Um, we're actually going to do an activity with this on the next slide. So if everybody could find um, their pointer tool, it looks like a little sun icon. There's a blow up of it there on the left side. If everybody can find a pointer, you're just going to go ahead and hover over that and um, pick the one that you want. And then um, you can practice. You can all practice on this slide. Hopefully you can see I've, I've selected the sunshine and I'm doing that right now. So go ahead and pick one of those, and we'll move on to the next slide. We're going to have you do a little activity with that. Great. You guys are awesome. Good job. All right. So um, this is just a fun little thing uh, that Jen and I like to do. We like to see where everyone is joining us. And originally, we started this as um, just a Washington state map. And um, while that was really cool, we've actually had people joining us from other states. We've had presenters in other states. So um, we've had to expand our territory. And yes, we know this map is in French. Um, it is an open source map, which is why I selected it. So um, hopefully, we can make sense of the French, and you can find where you are. I'm I'm going to go ahead and plunk myself down here in Washington. And if you would all go ahead and use your pointer tool to show us where you're at. Uh, we've got Brenda down here in sunny Florida. She picked the sun. Um, that's a very good icon for you, emoticon. Got lots and lots and lots of people up there in the corner of Washington. wonder if we have any Oregon or Idaho folks with us today. Doesn't look like it. Looks like we're mostly in Washington today. All right, great. OK. Um, so the next tool we're going to um, use is the polling tool. And if you'll give me just one second, I do need to um, change this to the ABC polling type. OK. There we go. All right, we are set to go. So um, this was kind of a topic we were um, talking about right before we started the recording. And we were um, just saying that some people have been asking us uh, what alignment was. So um, if you'll do me the honors of answering this question real quick, just go ahead and select A for yes or B for no. And let me know, do you know what alignment means in relation to outcomes, course content, learning activities, and assessment? And so we've only got a few people that have answered. So I'm going to go ahead and answer two. There we go. Now we've got some more people going. OK, I'm going to publish our results to the whiteboard for us now. There you go. And you can see um, a couple people didn't answer. And then um, several people did say that they know what it is. And we've got some folks joining us today um, that aren't as familiar with alignment. So um, that's great. OK. I'm going to go ahead and clear those. And let's go on to the next slide. All right, so we have um, another polling question. We actually have several polling questions this time. Uh, one, just because it's fun to ask questions and get answers. And another, just because it, it's nice to share the information and kind of get a gauge for where everybody's at. So what is your level of confidence that the critical elements in your course are truly aligned? If you'll go ahead and answer that. I'm going to say B for myself. I'm pretty confident, but you know I'm always looking to be able to improve. All right, so let's give everybody a chance to answer. And then I'm going to publish this for us. OK, so we've got um, some people that are confident, some that are sort of confident, and some that are somewhat confident. So I, I think um, that you'll be all enlightened at the end of um, this webinar. I know I'm going to be. I know that our presenters are going to share some fabulous information with me and get me thinking about this topic. OK, so um, just a little bit of meeting netiquette. Um, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. We are set to four simultaneous speakers, so we don't like to have everybody um, talking at the same time. Click that talk button when you're called on. Once you've raised your hand, it will put you in a numbered queue, and we'll know what order to call on you in. So that's a really helpful tool for us as moderators to be able to use. Again, use those emoticons to um, indicate approval or a job well done. And then um, remember to type your questions into the chat as we go. And we will come back and revisit those questions during the Q&A at the end. We do like to let our presenters speak uninterrupted. If you have a thought or a comment or a question or something you'd like to share while one of the presenters is speaking, please type that into the chat, and then we'll go back to it. All right, so um, these are our presenters. We're joined today by our esteemed guest, Brenda Boyd. She is the Director of Professional Development and Consulting from Quality Matters. 
We're also joined by Christy Spinney, who teaches um, office technologies. So she's office technologies faculty from Skagit Valley College. And by Judy Penn, who is biology faculty from Shoreline Community College. And um, Brenda, I'll turn it over to you in just one second. We're going to do our one more poll, and then um, We'll, we'll get you going. OK, I got to clear our other results. Oh, you already did it for me. Thank you. All right, so um, before Brenda gets started, um, in addition to wondering how familiar you all are with the concept of alignment, uh, Jennifer and I were also wondering how familiar you are with Quality Matters. So um, go ahead and answer that. If you're very familiar, check A. If you're somewhat familiar, B. And if you're unfamiliar, um, please click on C. Okay, so we've got several people that have answered, so let's publish those. Okay, so um, we've got most folks that are um, pretty familiar with the Quality Matters program, and um, one who needs to maybe learn, needs to um, hear some more about it. All right, let's go ahead and clear these, and we'll move on. I'll turn it over to you, Brenda, so take it away. Thank you, Alyssa, um, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, we're going to be talking about integrating alignment. And so before we get into that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Quality Matters. Um, Quality Matters is a faculty-driven peer review process. And it's collaborative in that we have teams of reviewers. It's faculty helping faculty. And it's a collegial review. So as educators, professionals, we are providing each other with helpful feedback that's going to lead to continuous improvement, which is our next underlying principle. Um, and continuous improvement is really one of the hallmarks of Quality Matters. We aren't looking for perfection. We're just trying to get continuous improvement because we know nothing is perfect. So um, there's always room for improvement. And Quality Matters is also centered around student learning, and it is also supported by research. So this is, these are the underlying principles that drive the Quality Matters program. So if you're unfamiliar, this is going to be your 11 second, <laughs> this is going to be your very short introduction to Quality Matters. Um, it's important to note that Quality Matters um, understands the importance of the faculty member in both design and delivery. And we differentiate between design, which is all of the forethought and planning that goes into a course before it is offered. So if you can think of this vertical arrow on this slide as midnight, the night before the course um, begins, the course delivery starts the um, the day that the course begins. So this is the actual teaching of the course. And excuse me, it is important to note that Quality Matters is all about course design. It's not about um, delivery or about faculty performance or how you teach. Um, it's about the course design. And so what do we mean by quality? We're not looking, again, for perfection. Um, quality Matters standard is 85%, which is um, based on widely accepted standards. And um, we're really trying to look at course design through the lens of through the lens of a um, we're looking at course design through the lens of a student point of view. So all of the recommendations are really about helping students be successful in courses compared to the Quality Matters standards. So let's take a look at some of the standards from the Quality Matters rubric. Um, Quality Matters has a rubric, a process, and professional development to support um, the integration of, of alignment and also other standards that are in the rubric. There are eight general standards in the Quality Matters rubric. Um, there, these are the eight general standard area titles. And there are additional, um, the, and these are eight general standards, but there are 43 specific review standards broken down in, um, amongst those eight general standard areas. And um, you can see here that there are some of these um, standards are in bold, starting with the learning objectives or competencies, assessment and measurement, instructional materials, course activities and learner interaction, and then course technology. And those, those five general standards have um, a total of six specific review standards within them that must um, align. So what do we mean by alignment? 
we are looking for all of the critical course elements to help the learner get to the desired learning outcomes. So all, they're all going to work together. So if we think about alignment as a building, so here's our analogy. The foundation is set with our learning objectives. Stand, specific Review Standard 2.1 looks for measurable course level objectives. Standard 2.2 looks for measurable module or unit, you might call them topic or weekly objectives that are also consistent with those course level objectives and they should also be measurable. So as, with that as our foundation, when we think about alignment, we, you know, we really want to get to that capstone to the, um, to the assessments. The assessments, um, it, standard 3.1 measures, it looks for, it looks at the assessments to see if they will actually measure those measurable learning objectives. And when we see our pillars here, we have standards 4.1, 5.1, and 6.1 that cover instructional materials, the course activities, and the course tools. And alignment can apply to any course. So even if you're teaching a face-to-face -face course, alignment principles still apply because these are, these are based in instruction and how course, um, instruction science and how, um, and how we ensure that the students are going to actually be able to meet the objectives. So when we think about our activities and our instructional materials, we're not going to be looking at the actual content and the choices that were made for the course, but looking at the instructional materials to see if the instructional materials will support the students in reaching the desired learning outcomes. Do the course activities help the students scaffold up toward the learning to, to reach their assessments? Are the course tools appropriate for the activities that you want them to do? So even if you have a face-to-face -face course and you have an online activity, are you using a course tool that's going to help the students get there? Is, are you using a wiki maybe or something like that for students to collaborate? So there are, um, so this is what we mean when we talk about alignment. So there are quite a few, um, you know, so there are just six standards out of the 43 specific standards in the CUNAM rubric that look at alignment, but these are, um, these are really, um, they're all essential. So if a course goes through a review, these standards must be met in order for um, the, in order for the course to meet QM standards. So, um, so we really um, have a focus on alignment. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to Christy. Um, oh, before I do, we have a question. Um, if you could please answer the question, have you ever, um, <laughs> um, A, have you ever mapped out the alignment in your course? Um, the choice of B is you wanted to map it out, but you really didn't know how. And C is the choice of you've never, con you haven't ever considered mapping the alignment in your course. So please, um, please choose A, B, or C. Okay, looks like some people have started answering. I'll go ahead and publish those for us. Okay, publishing those. And it looks like some of us have done some mapping um, and some of us didn't answer the question. Um, I would like, be just before we get um, turning this over to um, our faculty presenters, I would like to point out that alignment is something that trends in transcends all course modes, and I truly feel that um, Quality Matters does as well. Um, most people, when you think of Quality Matters, you're probably going to think that it's um, specifically for online or hybrid mode courses, um, but really, who doesn't want to make sure that their outcomes are aligned with their assessments, with their course content, and with their um, learning activities? So I really think that there's a lot in the Quality Matters rubric that applies to um, all, all classrooms, so I just wanted to, to mention that. All right, Christy, let's turn it over to you. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank yeah. you, Brenda. I'm a little yeah. jealous that you are in Florida, but I have to tell you that it is beautiful and sunny in Washington today, <laughs> so I like that. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about my alignment journey, and um, I'm going to also uh, tell you that this is true confession time for me. As a subject matter expert, I have been guilty of instinctively or maybe intuitively designing a class based on my knowledge and expertise with the content. 
not that I didn't think about how I could best help students learn, but I didn't often think intentionally about how all of the pieces of my course work together and how I could document that so that it was obvious to me, my students, and others, such as peer reviewers. So my journey to deliberately think about alignment and to show how alignment occurs in my courses really came with my introduction to the QM standards, um, also subsequent training in QM, and then ultimately the achievement of two QM certified courses that were peer reviewed. So it has been a process. But for me, alignment um, is my ability to show why I do what I do in my course and how what I do relates to helping students attain the course objectives. Um, it, it, it's a journey, and I'm still in that process. So as Brenda talked about, course objectives are the foundational piece to alignment. Um, many times we inherit course objectives. That happened to me. I walked into a job. Um, they handed me the course objectives that were written either by a previous instructor or were written in a department meeting five years ago. So the first thing I had to do was to really take ownership of my course objectives. I needed to make sure that they were current and relevant. Um, I teach in the technology field, so ours change every so often. We need to drop out uh, an objective and put in a new one. I needed to make sure that they were well written uh, from a student perspective. And then I needed to bring them to my department to discuss and to get approved. And then I needed to keep them in front of me when I began to design my courses because they are the guiding principle to everything that I do in that course. So what I've now done, I've, I've built kind of an annual review of my course objectives into my schedule. So every year we have to review our catalog content. So when that comes up, I just make it a habit now to also review my course objectives in my courses. Not that each one is perfect yet. As I said, it's a process. Um, but I, I like to continue looking at them and making sure they are current, relevant, well-written. Sometimes I go, ooh, that sounded good to me last year. It doesn't sound quite so good this year. Maybe I can improve that a bit. So what I'm going to share with you now is just kind of a diagram of the, the process that I kind of go through as I think about alignment in my course. Once I have current and well-written course objectives, I now focus on selecting course materials that can best be used to help students obtain the objectives um, for the course. So again, those could be books, journal articles, web resources, videos, instructor recordings. You know, the list can go on and on. But what are those resources that can be used by my students to obtain those course objectives? Once I have at least some of my main course materials identified, I can now take that um, content and break it into manageable learning modules. And those learning modules or learning units should also have identified very specific learning outcomes. And as I'm writing those, I look back at my course objectives to make sure that they fit into one of those. Now, I will tell you, every once in a while I'll come across one and go, ooh, that doesn't quite fit into any of my course objectives. Do we need to add another course objective that maybe we have overlooked? So I don't want to say that one process is exclusive of the other. It's kind of um, a review for me as I go through each of them. And I might decide, you know what, there's a course objective that we have overlooked that we need to add in when I'm writing my module objectives. But once I have those module objectives, then I think about designing learning activities that will help the students attain, you know, the knowledge and the skills that they need to um, ensure that they have attained those course objectives, those learning objectives. So what are the learning activities that, um, for me, these tend to be non-graded or low-stake grading projects that help them learn. And then I have ways that I want to develop to also assess those objectives. Again, this isn't a linear process as it kind of looks like here. Sometimes it is a back and forth process. Maybe I find that there's content that's missing from um, some of my unit projects. It's not in my book and I need to 
do a recording or find other additional resources to help support that learning that might be missing. So once I've done this, then my next step was figuring out how I'm going to show it. How do I show that my course objectives, my module objectives, my activities, and my assessments really do align with each other? And so what I chose to do was to simply use a very basic word table. And I know this is kind of small um, to, to read all this well, but just let me explain what I did. The, this particular course has 16 course outcomes. So I created 16 tables in a Word document. And at the top row of each table, I just copied and pasted in the course outcome. And then I began looking at each of my modules, and I identified, so if you look down um, the left-hand column, I've identified different learning objectives for different units or modules in my course. And I have a row that identifies when I teach that particular module, so week two, week four, week five, week six, and I show those learning activities. Then I use the right column to actually put in um, the activities and assessments that I'm using that go hand in hand with ensuring that the students can attain those learning objectives. And again, if I look back up my top row, I can see that all of these relate to course outcome 14, which is stated there. Now, there are all kinds of wonderful diagramming tools and mapping tools, and I found these a little cumbersome because, as you can see, I have, um, for this one outcome, it's, it takes four different modules for the students to actually be able to achieve that outcome. And so trying to put that all into a little diagram didn't work for me. This was just nice, simple, straightforward. I could do a lot of copying and pasting right into the table. So this helps me see what I'm doing, matching up my unit objectives with a course outcome, showing my learning and assessment activities as well. It helps me see where I have holes. Sometimes I'll look at one of my learning objectives and say, you know what, my learning activities don't really match that well, or I don't really have a good way to assess this yet. And that's something that I will work on to improve in the course. So when I'm completed, um, with this task. So in this particular course, I have 16 tables. I have a document that then groups, organizes, maps, so whichever word you want to use, the unit of objectives with the activities. And I will just very quickly show what this looks like in my learning management system. So if you go to a module in my LMS, I state those same learning objectives. I also relate those to exactly which course outcomes they apply to. So you've seen that first sentence up there under learning objectives. that They relate to outcomes 14, 15, 16. I'll list the learning activities for the students. And then you see the beginning of an assessment activity. So my students actually see that in the LMS. And then finally, as I conclude here, I state all of the learning outcomes in my syllabus. Again, a word table, very simple. Um, I'm just showing the last five rows of this table here, but I list each outcome. And then over on the right, because I have this all mapped out into my little word tables, I can show which modules apply to each one of the learning outcomes. So the students have that to reference as well. The whole idea is making it visible for me, my students, and peer reviewers or others who might be interested in how everything aligns in my course. And I am then Sherry. I will pass the microphone on to Judy. Hello, everyone. I like that Christy called this a journey because I think it is something that continues on and on, and it's not something you just do once and forget about. Um, I can say that I first learned about the QM process and the QM uh, alignment outcomes probably about six years ago. And for me, um, when I looked at those alignment standards and I started to think, oh, how am I going to check this in my course, I sort of hit a roadblock. And I decided 
I'm not really sure I know how to do this. Um, where do I start? And so, like I always do when I'm not sure how to do something, I procrastinate. And I did for about four or five years. And finally, I met our newly hired uh, instructional designer about a year and a half ago. And she was the one who was willing to sit down with me and help me to get started with the um, alignment process for my epidemics course. And as a result, it was certified about this time last year. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about my journey and my uh, the way we did it. And I think one thing I'd like to emphasize is that we really do have um, each our own way of doing these. And I think one has to find what works best for their own courses. I've taught these courses for quite a while. And for me, it was a matter of uh, first looking to see what I already had. Um, obviously, I had a course description, a course objectives, um, activities, assessments. They were already set up in my online courses. And what I didn't have were module objectives. Um, but Livia, our instructional designer, pointed out to me that I did have module study questions. And so one of our tasks was to use those to create module objectives. And because of that little gap, um, we had we developed sort of a unique system of, of proceeding with this alignment check. Um, and we knew that we had to check several aspects uh, listed here. But we decided to start um, in, a, in, a, in a bit of an unusual um, sequence. The first thing that Livia asked me to do was sort of a surprise. She asked me to look at my course descriptions and think about what Bloom's taxonomy categories did that description really focus on. And then she asked me to compare that with my course objectives. And I thought that was a little weird, but she explained to me that most of the general public doesn't really see my course objectives. When they first look at the course, they either see it in a catalog or in a course description in a course schedule. And so we had to be sure that that course description really matched with the course objectives. And lucky for me, it seemed to do that with both of the courses that I've worked on so far. Um, but it was a kind of an unusual step because I hadn't really thought about including the course description in the process. Um, and the next step then was to go forward and look at my study questions trying to find common themes so that I could put them together into a single objective. And I ended up with uh, about four to eight module objectives for each of my modules in the course. At that point, it seemed logical because I was just starting to look at the module objectives and I just formulated them. It seemed logical for me to just simply work with those to start with, even though it seems like it's sort of the bottom of the process. So what we did was take the module objectives, and this table looks somewhat like the one that Christy showed you. Um, we took the module objectives, and we compared them with the learning activities and assessments in each of those modules. And I'll show you one of the things that resulted from that process. Uh, when I was getting my course uh, ready for review, it, I just submitted one for review. When I was getting it ready for review, I realized that um, when I had done the shift from my shortened summer quarter to the spring quarter, where I'm teaching it now, um, I had somehow mixed up my sustainability topic. And I ended up with uh, the outcomes in the module objectives for module one, but I really didn't assess until module two. So in that respect, I was able to recognize that these two objectives should really be moved to module two, and I did that. Um, so sometimes this kind of alignment uh, process does help you to realize that there are some, maybe some confusing things that might um, cause your students to wonder what was going on, uh, and this helped me to kind of get it, get it uh, a little better organized. Once we had the modules aligned with the activities and resources and assessments, then we moved to looking at the alignment of the modules with the course learning objectives. And so I created a table like this one where I listed my module objectives on the left side of the table. And then right above them, I numbered my course objectives, each with a number, and then created a column on the right side 
that showed um, the number of each of those course objectives. And so when I plug in a module, uh, you can see that here, um, I have in this particular module for my gardening class, I have five um, module objectives, and then I look to see which of the course objectives would um, correspond to those particular module objectives. So you can see in this particular module, it seems to have a pretty heavy focus on objective number two, but as I look at all of them accordingly for all of the whole class, then I could see that, yes, indeed, um, throughout the course, I have covered each of those eight uh, objectives. I've assessed each of those eight objectives. Um, and I can also see if there are maybe, is maybe too much emphasis on one objective versus another. Um, so uh, maybe that objective needs to be split into two separate objectives. And maybe another objective needs to be de-emphasized. So it helps me to be able to kind of see um, the focus of the course in a little more graphic uh, representation. And it helps me to make sure that I'm covering what I say I'm covering in the course learning objectives. So again, this was my experience. And it seemed to work well enough for me on the first round with my 150 class that I decided to go ahead and use it for the course that I just recently submitted for uh, review. And um, I'm going to just go through the process that we use one more time, and then I'm going to talk about what I'd like to do um, to continue this. Um, my course description and course objectives were checked to be sure they matched. Um, and then we went forward from there to create the module objectives and the module activities and assessments were checked to make sure that they correlated with the module objectives. And then as, as sort of the last step, we filled in the last gap by correlating those module objectives with the course objectives. Now, I do represent these in my Canvas classrooms. For instance, I have at the beginning of each module, I have a page that shows the module objectives. And I also on that page um, include the student study questions as well as a a uh, weekly checklist that shows the activities they're going to be doing. What I'd like to do, and I'm, I'm especially interested in Christy's model of how she showed the connection between the activities and assessments, the module objectives, and the course objectives. And I think I could probably do the latter, uh, the connecting of the course objectives, just a little bit better um, in the future. So that will be one of my goals to get um, my course just a little bit more obvious to my students as to how things align. So again, it is, as Christy said, it's a journey. Um, and it's a journey that can be approached in a lot of different ways. Um, this is the method that seems to work well for me with established courses. But certainly, um, the order of these tasks can be rearranged depending on how you're doing your class. For instance, if I were starting a brand new class, I might go from top to bottom. And once I have my course objectives, then I would start to create my module objectives and then create my activities and assessments. But with existing courses, that just uh, to do the checking, that just didn't seem quite to work for me. And so uh, this method of kind of um, starting from the bottom and working up seemed to work pretty well. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Alyssa. All right. Thank you. Um, gosh, you guys are just so fabulous. Um, actually, we're not going to answer that question just yet. We're going to go to Q&A now. So I didn't really see um, too many comments um, or questions in um, the chat. So if you have a question about alignment or a topic relating to alignment um, or something about the, the process that Christy or um, Judy are using, now is a great time to ask that. You can go ahead and type those into the chat, or you can go ahead and raise your hand. This is what it looks like when you raise your hand. Um, you should see a little hand next to my um, name at the top of the participant panel there, and it shows the number one. So go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to speak, or type your questions and um, comments into the chat box for us, and we'll, we'll go, go to those. And that was my cell phone. You just heard dinging me in the background. I always forget to turn that darn thing off before we start a webinar. Last time it actually rang. OK, let's see. It looks like we have our first question. Um, Monica Hansen, go ahead. Click your talk button. Yeah. 
Okay. Can you hear me? We can. I um, got the microphone all set up before, and I tested it out. Way and go. I just I wanted to let you know that this is so well done. I didn't put any comments in the chat box while everyone was talking because I didn't want to interrupt and distract anyone from listening. So I wanted to let you know that. But I really appreciate the visuals that you have um, provided in charting out your journeys through this. So that's all I had to say. Okay, thank you. I do agree. Um, the visuals that um, Christy and um, Judy have used here have really helped um, give a framework for different ways to understand this. And I love the um, building analogy that Brenda used to show how all these things are, are connected. So, yeah. Um, somebody else want to ask a question? Boy, you guys are quiet today. I should have my crickets turned on. All right, well, um, oh, yay. OK, so question um, from, I can't see who raised their hand. Alyssa, it's me, Brenda. Oh, Brenda, hi. Sorry, you were at the very, very top of the <laughs> list. I just barely <laughs> scrolled up and saw you, so go ahead. Well, I just wanted to point out that if you're at a Quality Matters subscribing institution, you can kind of um, look at the standards and the annotations for the standards and do a self-review in the course review management system that you have access to um, as part of your Quality Matters subscription. And you can look at the standard and the annotation, which has a lot of examples, which um, aren't as, um, I mean, I have to admit, they're not as robust as the examples that Judy and Christy have shown because these are you know, there's specific review standards. But you can do a self-review um, using the self-review tool, and that's available to all QM subscribers. And you can make notes to yourself in there as you're doing your own self-review um, self of your course to see um, where you might want to make some changes or where you think that you are meeting the standards. So um, I did want to point out that that's a tool that's available to all of you who are at um, uh, Quality Matters subscribing institutions. Thank you, Brenda. That was um, a really good topic for you to bring up and for you to point out, so thanks. Um, I would also like to mention um, that all 34 of our Washington Community and Technical Colleges are subscribers. Uh, the State Board eLearning, um, we pay for a system subscription, so we are subscribed as a system. You do have access to training. A little earlier in um, the webinar, I pasted some information um, about about finding out about Quality Matters training. So you can go to that SBCTC webpage and um, find out about that. And um, we can, um, if you have more questions, you can always email me. I'll type my email into the chat here real quick. So you can uh, send me additional questions if you want to know something after the fact. Okay, so there is my email address if um, anybody needs to contact me or ask me a question. I am um, the Lead Quality Matters Coordinator for the state, and then each of our colleges has um, their own lead. And um, normally those lead coordinators will be found in your e-learning offices. So uh, if you want to find campus-specific information about Quality Matters, I would suggest a quick trip over or maybe a call or email to your e-learning office. All right, any more questions? or comments, or, OK, uh, Judy, go ahead. I was just thinking about mentioning that um, certainly this process may seem like it's um, kind of even kind of overwhelming, even though I hope we've made it seem a little bit easier. Um, these things can happen gradually, too. Um, I know that when I did my gardening class, getting ready for this, the uh, current review, when I set it up last summer, I started thinking about some of these things and, and, and started plugging a few things in as I set the class up. So I think you can module up, not to use the word module too much, but you can put these into small tasks and do them gradually. You don't necessarily have to do it all in one sitting or one big lump. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a good idea, Judy, to take it in little chunks. Um, I get overwhelmed by lots of information easily, and I think it would be a lot easier to think about it if you take just smaller pieces, maybe just do one module at a time, or whatever works for you. Everybody's process is a little different. All right, I'm waiting for somebody else to raise their hand. And um, if we don't have any takers for more questions or comments, I will go ahead and go to another polling question that we wanted to ask you all. All right, um, we'll go ahead and go to the polling question. Um, but if you do have um, further questions uh, after we move on, please feel free to raise your hand and ask those. We'll, we'll continue answering them as we go. All right, so um, here's a question for you. Um, go ahead and use the polling tool again. How confident do you feel? feel about checking for alignment in your courses? We'll wait a second here for a few more people to weigh in. Okay, looks like we've got a good group of you that have weighed in. So um, I'm going to go ahead and publish these to the whiteboard. And there you can see that most of us feel pretty confident. We're getting there. So um, that's good. I hope this uh, webinar gave you some good ideas. I know personally I'm going to um, take a few ideas from Christy and a few ideas from Judy. And also um, Stephanie Diemel included some different, um, some similar type information in a presentation she did at the um, regional conference, QM conference recently. And I'm going to maybe steal a few things from her too to, to use for, for the alignment in my course. All right, let's go ahead and clear these, and we'll go on. Um, so this is just an opportunity for you all to share. Um, we were just curious if any of you are using a specific method to map the alignment of the critical elements in your course. And if you are, um, would you mind typing a, a brief description of what you're doing um, into the chat window, or um, even just raise your hand to explain. I know Dawn mentioned earlier in the chat that um, she had taken a class that used course maps, and I was going to ask her to expand on that a little bit, but I did see that she had checked herself as a way a minute ago, so I'm not sure if she's back yet or not. Um, okay, it looks like Dawn is there, and I think she's typing something, so we'll give her a second to do that. Does anybody else have... Um, a method for alignment that um, they'd like to talk about, maybe a different type of table. All right, let's see who's got their hand up. Okay, that would be Monica. Go ahead, Monica. One thing that I did, I, um, I had course objectives that were handed to me when I inherited a, a general psychology class, and I went through a similar process in putting mine together using like weekly modules and those activity outcomes that the first example described. And then um, when I was done teaching that nine times, the same class, I decided to um, look at, use that exact same outcomes as a form of evaluation, self-evaluation that the students did. And I made the, the matrix um, for the students that had those outcomes stated in the same language that was in the syllabus. And we used it as a review. And they brainstormed all the activities um, together before looking at the matrix. They brainstormed all of the activities that they had done in the class. So we had this huge pool of, do you remember when we did this presentation? Do you remember when we did this? And we put those up on the board, and then they used the matrix to fill in where they thought they best met that course objective. And so it was an, a, a form of evaluation for me, but it was really useful to redesign the course for next year. I was able to go back and look, is the activity that I thought I was you know, to look at my alignment. Is this what I was really achieving by doing this activity? Was there a better activity? And it helped me um, redesign. That is awesome. I don't know that I would have thought to have students help with that. That is a fantastic idea, Monica. I really, really, really like that. And it looks like um, Christy's agreeing with you. She says, wow, what an awesome way to assess. 
And Brenda says, great idea to really get the student viewpoint. Yeah, I think that idea totally rocks. So good, good work. Good job. Well, Thanks and then for sharing. One other, one other thing I wanted to add about that is that it also helps them realize what they've learned in the class as part of the review. Sometimes I've noticed that even though you have it all aligned and laid out for them, and it, they don't actively engage in that alignment process like you did, putting all the pieces together, they don't realize everything that they've learned. But when I asked them to do that, they had to actually think about it. And I think they get a better sense of fulfillment from the class that way. Yeah, that is just a fantastic idea. I really, really, really love that. Anybody else like to share? Um, Don had typed in a second ago um, about the the maps that, um, let's see, what did she say? Um, I think it was something about putting the map in the syllabus was her comment. Um, so a, like a full color visual map of how the outcomes align with assessments and the content. I think that is an awesome idea too. I am so visual. I know that as a student that I would really have appreciated um, the opportunity to have that more infographic type understanding of um, how all those course pieces work together. All right. Uh, anybody else want to share anything? OK. Um, we can, um, if there are no other questions and we don't have any other things to share, we'll um, go ahead and get started on um, closing up shop here. So um, here are some additional resources. And these resources were provided to us by Quality Matters. So thank you, Brenda, for um, sending those to me earlier so that we could include them here. And I know that I saw one earlier. Um, I can't remember which one it was. It might have been the first or second link that I had clicked on. There was something about um, including a visual or an infographic or graphic of um, the um, alignment in the course. And so um, that was really great that, that Monica mentioned that. But there's a resource in here, too. So um, check these out if you have time. And um, I know you can't click on or get to any of these from here. All this information will be posted to uh, the ATL blog. And so if you want to go back and find the recording and the resources, you can do that here. I'm just going to go grab the URL for the blog. I'll be right back with that. OK, so here's the URL for the blog in the chat. Um, you can just go there and um, Oops, let me get that in there. OK, so you can just go to the ATL blog and find the drop down menu. There's a whole section that is dedicated to the IGNIS content. And then on the drop down menu, if you just click on webinar recordings, you'll find the recording. You will also find the actual presentations. So um, our presentation and uh, the presentations from each of our presenters will be posted there along with any additional um, resources or any other activities that we did during the webinar. So you can always go there to find those. And please share this out with um, friends and coworkers, anybody that might be interesting and interested in that. And here's how to contact Jennifer and I. I did put my email address into the chat earlier. Um, you can reach either one of us by email or by phone. And then um, Jen has the blog site there that we just talked about. And um, we each also have Twitter handles. So I'm at Washington eLearning, and she's at Jen with them, SBCTC. And there is a comment in the chat um, from Monica um, thanking us for modeling the use of Collaborate and all the tools and features available in it. So um, thank you, Monica, for noticing. That is one thing that we do strive to do during these webinars is to um, help people feel comfortable with the interface and hopefully inspire you all to go out and maybe try um, collaborate on your own, either with a student or for a meeting with colleagues. Um, I use it. I think I use Collaborate at least once a day, if not more. So um, it's really been a great tool. And um, let's see. Oh, one other thing. We ask you guys to share your thoughts about this webinar. And there's a survey monkey there. I'm going to go grab that um, link for us. Let's see. Did I accidentally close it? 
Okay, it take me just one second. Let me grab that for you guys. And then um, I'll put the link into the chat, and you guys can just um, click on that straight from um, straight from the chat and go there and just take a minute to, to fill that out for us if you don't mind. Okay, and then um, we'll sign off with um, telling you what's up next time. In two weeks, on May 21st, we have Making Accessibility Accessible, and we'll be joined by Terrell Thompson from the University of Washington. So um, I hope that you will um, come for that, and then we'll do a follow-up to his um, presentation um, the following week. It will be, I think it's May 28th, and we'll announce this um, again, but um, on May 28th, one of our faculty learning communities from Shoreline, um, who did some excellent work on accessibility this year, um, they are going to follow Terrell's um, presentation with a presentation of their own and help people understand how to make a syllabus accessible. So you're going to learn a lot about um, using Word and how to make documents screen reader friendly. So um, we've still got two great webinars coming up in this season, so we hope that you'll join us for that and we thank you and um, I recently added I don't know why I hadn't done it before but at the bottom here you'll see that all of the Ignis content is licensed under a Creative Commons license and I had previously neglected to put um, that attribution into our um, presentation so it's here now but do know that all of the content we produce for Ignis is open it's free to use take it adapt it um, change colors present it to at your own schools whatever um, works for you it's there we love to share so thank you for joining us and um, I'm going to go ahead and um, thank our presenters before I turn off our recording Brenda thank you so much uh, Judy thank you so much and Christy thank you so much you guys were all fabulous you totally rocked the whole thing and um, you guys were awesome. It was, it was really, really great. So thank you.